Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. Hello, and welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. I'm a mom of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant who works for yoga teachers. This podcast was created for you so that you can connect to the information and inspiration every single week and feel supported as you navigate these sometimes tricky jungles of being a yoga teacher and also an entrepreneur. The COVID-19 pandemic has drastically changed the world we live in, and many of us have had to make the leap to shift our businesses online and offer our yoga classes and workshops virtually. Some of us yoga teachers were really ready to take things online. Some of us were learning as we went. And I'm talking with a group of yoga teachers now who is seeing the value of bringing yoga classes online. Even though they didn't jump in to do it, they want to learn how to do it now. I think across the board, there's a lot of value in knowing how we can leverage this online space in our yoga business to bring yoga to more people and grow our business at the same time. Whether you're looking at creating this foundation to sell your online classes or courses, or maybe you want to figure out how to put your social media posts together or get videos up on YouTube, most of us could do with a little help when it comes to growing our online yoga business. And this is why I am super excited about today's guest. Nikki Nab Levy runs a movement-based business that is almost 100% online, and she has such great insights about what it takes to transition your yoga business or your movement modality business to the virtual world. And she really walks us through how we can make this shift. We discuss some common questions like, how can I set myself apart from other teachers when we're all teaching the same thing? What should I post on social media? And how can I get past the fear of putting myself out there? We also talk about figuring out which online products to offer or which things will sell best. And Nikki offers some really cool insight into her own business and how she branded and how that came about and how that works in her videos. And if you're thinking about moving online and automatically you start to get worried about fancy tech and needing that to be successful, don't worry. Like many of our guests, Nikki talks about how we need to start where we're at and start small and just dive in and begin somewhere. If you are listening on the go, not to worry, we take the notes for you and they can all be found at the connectedyogateacher.com. And for this episode, they can all be found at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 181. Have you left us a review yet? There are a couple of ways that you can do this if you haven't already. One is to go to our Facebook page, look for the Connected Yoga Teacher page. You can leave us a review there. Or two is to go to any show notes page or go to iTunes and leave a review there. I want to send a huge shout out of thank you to Tara Ann Carroll from the United States for leaving a five-star review. Tara Ann says this podcast and the Facebook group are both such great resources. I love that Shannon talks about the business side of things as well as introduces a variety of other topics and addresses specific questions. If you're a yoga teacher, subscribe and join the Facebook group. Thank you so much, Tara. I agree. If you have not joined our Facebook group yet, go over to theconnectedyogateacher.com, look at our homepage, and look for the join button. As I'm recording this in August of 2020, we are almost 10,000 yoga teachers from around the world in there, and our goal is to be supportive and helpful to each other. So when you go in there and you ask a question, we ask that our members are posting things that are supportive and helpful, you know, bringing up great questions, interesting articles. And every once in a while, we have a share thread where you can share the events and the classes, the workshops and the things that you are creating. Speaking of workshops and offerings, right now I am just about to fill the Yoga for Pelvic Health training and I want to give a huge shout out to Schedulicity who helps me to do this even when I'm away from my desk. So the way this works is when I put a training like the Yoga for Pelvic Health training into Schedulicity, I decide how many spots there are to fill. And the really great thing is that 
no other people can sign up for it. So when people sign up and register, it holds their spot. It takes their payment. It does everything. I get a text or an email. It's an amazing system. And once that training or class is full, then I have a couple of options. I can have people join a wait list or it's just that it's full and people need to wait for the next time around. So Schedulicity is a software company that I have been using and trusting since 2011 as a studio manager, but also as an individual yoga teacher. And I'm super honored that they are our sponsor of the podcast. So let's hear our hot tip of the week from one of the team over at Schedulicity. Hi, Connected Yoga Teachers. This is Chelsea from Schedulicity with a hot tip of the week. Schedulicity's package management add-on is a great option for yoga teachers. This allows you to create an incentive package with a discount that can add value to your students' visits and help ensure their return business. If each one of your classes costs $10, you could create a 5 for 40 package and offer it online. Then, when your clients are booking a class, they'll see this option. Payment is required up front for packages, so you'll be paid and they'll have a great reason to come back. Maybe one five-class package is all they need to turn their yoga practice into a habit. Thank you so much, Schedulicity. Alrighty, let's dive into our interview today. Nikki Nablevi is a Pilates teacher and certified functional strength coach with over a decade of experience helping clients build strength and overcome injury. She holds degrees in exercise science and journalism and was second place in the 2018 Next Pilates Anytime Instructor Competition. Apart from her work with fitness and movement, Nikki also provides business consulting and copywriting services for movement teachers, particularly yoga and Pilates teachers, to help them build their businesses and get better at marketing. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Nikki. It's great to have you here today. Thanks. I'm excited to be here and talk about stuff. Yes, I am so excited because our yoga teachers have been asking all right, how can I take my yoga business online? And I'm excited to talk to you about it because you have done that. And you're not going to be afraid to tell us like, here are some of the things to watch out for, or here are the things not to do. So before we get into that, tell us about the work that you do and who you do it for. So I sort of, I would say, have two prongs of work that I do or people who I serve at this point. I would say one prong is in the fitness and movement side of things. Uh, depending on who you talk to, you could say I'm a Pilates teacher or a movement teacher or a fitness professional because I've studied all the things, but it's really just sort of helping teachers navigate that world of, and that information because there's a lot of it and it can be really confusing when you're working with clients, especially if they have injuries. Uh, and then just helping normal, quote unquote, normal people who aren't in fitness or aren't in movement navigate that world. Because again, there's a lot of information and it can be really confusing. Uh, and then on the flip side, what sort of has happened that's been interesting, I never thought I'd be inside of things is I do a lot of business consulting and copywriting uh, for movement teachers. And a large percentage of them are yoga teachers, which is sort of funny because even though I've done somatic education and massage, I, the one training I think I've never done is a yoga teacher training. Uh, but yeah, there's just, it, it, there's apparently an art form to figuring out how to take all of the esoteric language in our brains and communicate that esoteric language to normal people and students so they understand how we can help them and why we want to help them and how to make sense of that language. So that's a lot of what I do now. <laughs> this is really important work. I was just talking with a yoga teacher the other day and she wanted to talk about yin yoga. And I think in a short description, there were about five words that I said, you know, I don't think the average person walking off the street is going to know what that word is. So we're going to have to change it. Otherwise it's just another barrier holding someone back from signing up. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's huge and it's really hard to quote unquote, dumb yourself down because I think there's a lot of fear that your colleagues will judge you for using the wrong word or the quote unquote dumb word. Uh, but on the flip side, it's sort of like, if people can't understand what you're saying, 
then they don't understand how to use the information or how you can help them. And that was actually one of my very, very first uh, copywriting lessons, if you will, even before I knew what copywriting was. I started posting things on Instagram because a business coach told me I had to, even though I hated social media and I didn't want to be on a video. And I would write these, like, I mean, paragraphs in the captions of like biomechanical information. And of course, teachers started following me and none of the general public cared because no one understood it. But the teachers would come back to me and they'd go, wow, that thing you said about the vastus lateralis was really smart. You're really smart. And I went, cool. Can you use that? Did you use that? And they went, no, I had no idea what that meant. And I went, oh, I've got to find a better way of communicating with people. If you just think I'm smart, that's not the goal of me suffering social media. I don't care if you're smart. I, like, if you, I don't care if you think I'm smart. I want you to like be able to use this so it can help you. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. Oh my gosh. That makes so much sense. And I think sometimes we're fr- either we get in the pattern, like we go to so many yoga teacher trainings or different trainings or anatomy trainings. We become really comfortable with saying different things. Like I know I'll say sacrum and just think everyone in the world knows where their sacrum is, but no, not everyone does. They have no idea what that is. Like, it's not like knee or elbow. Right. And, and even then, I mean, if you've ever been on the floor and tried to understand someone's cueing, even if you know what your knee is, it's amazing how often the knee becomes a confusing joint when you're also trying to learn movement. It's like, bend your knee. And then suddenly an arm goes in the air and it's like, wait, what? And it's just the translate. I mean, it's like the more language we add in, I think the worse it gets sometimes. That's so true. So tell our yoga teachers, how did you, how did this journey happen? Did you, did you plan for this moving your business online or is this just something that evolved over time? Well, it depends on how far back in time you go into my iteration as a teacher. Cause I started teaching movement when I was 19. So I'll try to keep this short. So I sort of went group fitness instructor to very injured group fitness instructor making no money. So I realized I had to do privates. So then I became privates Pilates teacher who did group fitness on the side. And then I was so injured that I couldn't teach any group fitness because I could barely move, which sent me down the, you know, studying chronic pain post rehab side of things. So then that turned me into studio owner because I was working for other people. And I went, yeah, this isn't going to cut it because I'm too irreverent to actually work for other people and unemployable. (laughs) And then I uh, started doing workshops. And then I met the man who is now my husband who did not live super close to where I lived. And I had this great following and a quote unquote profitable studio, which meant I was making very little money, but I owed money to the government. And right about then I went, oh, this is bad. If I want to actually make a living, I probably need to do something other than have a studio because if I ever move again, I'm going to have to keep starting over and I don't want to do that. And that's when I decided I was going to start doing things online. But it actually took me two and a half years to build enough of a following online and enough of an understanding of how to sell things online before I was able to actually make money online. And it took another year and a half before now I'm almost 98% online in my business. So really it was, I would say like a four year journey from in-person to online from the day I decided I was going to make money online to when I actually made like real money online. So it, it took a long time, like a really long time. (laughs) <laughs> this is good to know that it's not just an overnight thing. You didn't put up a few videos and then everyone rushed out to purchase your thing. I think this is really good, a really great takeaway. Two and a half years, I would wonder how many people who are like, I want to take my business online, if then you said to them, okay, plan for two and a half years for it to start making money if they feel like they can make that time investment. So yeah, time investment. I mean, I think so. I think it's a huge piece of it. And And could I have sold something sooner? Yes. But the thing is, I invested in learning the strategies of how to make money online and learning the strategies of an online business more than building a following. So I was making money online, like I was clearing seven and I mean, maybe it's ghost to talk about money, but I'm going to do it for people to know the reality of things. Like I was like, I made seven, I made just under 7k in my first launch. And I had over just over a thousand people on my list. And I had 1200 Instagram followers. I was not quote unquote famous, right? Right. I was just a normal person. Uh, I just, I just understood the strategy and I spent a lot of time learning how to communicate and a lot of time researching what product to launch and a lot of time building relationships with people who could help me get exposure. 
instead of trying to get followers. I didn't really care about followers. I didn't care about numbers because I knew that nothing I was doing was that interesting. And I was never going to like, I knew I was never going to be in, I knew I was never going to be an Instagram influencer. So I was like, I better find a, figure out a better way to make money because no one really cares about what I have to say otherwise. I heard you talking on, it was Francesca's podcast about your community strategy, building relationships over a long period of time. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that's really interesting that people forget about the internet is that we're just people behind the screens. So this weird thing happens when we see everyone's beautifully filtered photos and their 100,000 Instagram followers. We forget that they're not a celebrity and they're just a normal human, especially if they're a yoga teacher. I mean, I'm sure there's yoga teachers who think they're celebrities and that's fine. Um, But for the most part, right, most of us are just normal humans and a lot of the normal humans accidentally became quote unquote Instagram famous. And so when you go online, you can't just, it's like, you can't just show up to a party uninvited and be like, Hey guys, be my friend. That's really weird. That'd be really weird in person. And it's just as weird if you do it on the internet, if not stranger, because then they get an email and there's not even a face. They're like, are you normal? Are you a stalker? Are you going to cut off my head? I don't know. This is the internet. It's scary and weird. And so I very quickly realized, okay, I need a network to be successful because if you look around everyone is sort of, they're not, it's not always like a scheme to promote your friend's stuff, but because you're friends, you start collaborating and working together. And if, you know, someone has a large following and you become connected to them in a legitimate way, not like in a weird spammy way, and you start doing things together, then their following is going to start to know who you are and trust you and follow you too, and potentially buy your work in the long run and follow your work, appreciate your work. And so my strategy for this, because I was obsessed with podcasts and I clearly have no problem talking, was that I started a podcast because that made it much easier for me to reach out to people. And instead of being like, hi, be my friend, this is weird. I could be like, hey, your work is incredible. I'd like to interview you about XYZ. I think my community would find it really helpful. I think from studying your work, I think your community might find it really interesting to hear you talk about this. Uh, Would you be open to being a guest on my podcast? And then that would naturally evolve in a lot of cases into friendships and colleagues and networking. And that's really how I became established online was I just slowly built relationships with other people whose work I appreciated, some of whom had large followings, but some of whom didn't. That's not really what I was looking for, if that makes sense. Um, I was looking more for like relationships and people whose work I appreciated. And, you know, if you had a hundred thousand Instagram followers, like I'm not going to be mad about it. (laughs) Right. And I also (laughs) heard you share a strategy that you went into Facebook groups and helped, like didn't get in there and start saying, buy my thing, do my thing. Do you want to talk about that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reality is I, especially when I started doing this, I had nothing to sell anyways. Like I didn't know what I was selling yet and I was terrified to sell and I was terrified to promote myself, but I'm comfortable being helpful. So, I mean, there's a lot of people who run Facebook groups. And if you've ever been in one of those Facebook groups that has 10,000 people, I mean, man, people, the questions in there are wild uh, and the advice in there is wild for better or worse, but there's a lot of people who need help. And so I would go into Facebook groups of, Basically, because at the time, my audience was really in my head, general public who'd had a lot of repetitive stress injuries and pain because they hadn't really prepared their bodies for the aggressive workouts that they really enjoyed. And so I was like, great, I am actually, my my, my complimentary audience is fitness nuts who kind of, for lack of a nicer word, wrecked themselves a little bit and don't know why they hurt. And so I would go into these groups and I would basically answer insane and insane detail, weird questions about not, not without a scope of practice, but like, Hey, why do I feel stiff after I do this exercise? And I'd be like, of course, if it hurts, go to your doctor. But I, I basically help people. I would give long answers. I would give them resources to go look at. I'd give them some explanations. I'd tell them what to ask their PT if they were going to see a PT. And because my answers were detailed and thorough and I know my stuff, the moderators in the group noticed me. And in this case, a few of them actually, the leaders of the group friended me on Facebook, were like, hey, thanks so much for being so helpful in our community. And then actually invited me to write for them and contribute to their online stuff. So that's actually a lot of how I built relationship building in that case, again, because the people who are quote unquote, like famous online, they have like big thriving businesses, and they're really, really busy. And so 
the best way that you can get on someone's radar in a positive way is not say, oh my God, buy my thing. It's just show up and be helpful. Like be a member of the community, get to know the community and you'll find out if you actually want to be a part of it too. This is so good. I wish I could put this on a loudspeaker in every Facebook group that I'm a part of. (laughs) (laughs) This is really what gets the attention of everyone in the group, the members, as well as the people running that group. So great advice to, to form those connections. And it's not just like jumping in front of someone, you know, you wouldn't do that in person, jump in front of someone and say, here's my business card. And here's the thing that you can buy from me on that first meeting. So that's good. Right. And I I think we forget that, right? Like we know that when we're dating, right? When you go on a date, most of us, especially if, sorry, if you're a woman, but I'm sure men have experienced this too. Like I internet dated before I ever was like on the internet selling things. And let me tell you, if I met a guy and on the first date, he was like, here's a birthday cake, uh, you know, 20 roses. And also, will you marry me? And I love you. I'd be like, Oh, you're a lot. (laughs) <laughs> right? Like, 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 like the first, the first date is getting, get out. Like you kind of like get their favorite color, get their number, have a nice chat, say, good. I'll see you in a couple of days. Like you don't follow them home. Say, I want to marry you. Tell them all of your childhood trauma. And then like, and you just don't want to do that. And it's like the same thing when you're like building a relationship with someone who might potentially buy something from you one day, or who you want to work with. You don't want to go all in. You just want to say hello and not be weird about it. <laughs> Yes. Yes. This is so true and so helpful. That's one way to get noticed in Facebook groups. So the other thing I heard you say, I think on that same podcast was, you know what? Social media is great and fun, but get an email list and get some type of a website online. And I cannot stress how this really matters. Like people will say, oh, I post this thing to Instagram, you know, once or twice, and now no one has signed up. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? Yeah. I mean, so the thing is, you got to think about the long game. So like I said, it took me, let's say four years roughly to be entirely online. And my business looks nothing like what I thought it would four years ago. Nothing. My audience is different. What I'm offering is different. None of it's what I thought it was going to be. Uh, If I'm honest, I don't know if I really knew what it was going to be, but truly it's not what I expected. And something I didn't do early enough was I started actually, I started writing blogs because my undergrad was in journalism and writing long esoteric novels about the human body was apparently my idea of a good time, except (laughs) it wasn't. I just felt woefully inadequate. So I had to prove to everyone that I had something interesting to say by writing horrible, boring biomechanical blogs. But a lot of people started reading them anyway, for reasons I'll never understand. Thank you. And I should have been collecting emails then. And I didn't like, I just didn't appreciate it. But the long game of this is that the algorithm is always going to change. You don't own Instagram. Things could go down one day. And if you're going to sell something online, you're going to need multiple touch points for people to understand what it is that you're buying and for them to trust you enough and see it enough to actually want to buy something from you. And if you don't have an email list, you really don't know who is who you're getting in front of. You don't have people to poll to see if your product idea is a good idea. You don't have people to consistently build a relationship with. Like you, you really don't have a business because you don't have a pool of buyers to sell to. And Instagram, let's just go with Instagram because it's the most popular algorithm I'd say right now for this stuff in yoga land, is not a reliable source for selling. You might get some hits off of it, but also you don't know where those hits are coming from. Like I have videos, just for example, that I have 6,000 Instagram followers and some change. I have videos that'll get three to 6,000 views. And if I look in the insights, 87% of them will have come from people who aren't my followers. So like, I don't even know who I'm getting in front of half the time. And, and it's not a bad thing, but it's also, I know that if I'm trying to sell something online, Instagram isn't where my money is. My email list is because I have a lot, I've got a lot more consistency and I kind of, the same people are seeing it every single week. So you want to, and it takes a while to build that organic growth, even if you have an ad strategy. So the sooner you start with your email list, the sooner you can start to get to know the people who you're attracting and also know if you're attracting people who you actually want to help, or if you're getting a whole bunch of people who you're like, oh, you're not the audience I thought you were at all. Yes. I want to just call what you just said in, well, two things. You said earlier that you were scared to move your business online, afraid to do videos. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, absolutely. And and then also you had no idea what it was going to look like. Like you dove in, you started and it evolved. And I 
think that's the way online businesses go. I think we, we fumble around a little bit, like we're learning how to walk and we, we figure out how we want to walk, <laughs> where we want to walk as we go. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know about you, but, uh, like I'm more and more online these days. And I actually think I feel more confused now in some ways, even though I actually understand how to make money and do strategy than I did four years ago. Like I I actually have more of an identity crisis now that people know who I am than I did when I was just sitting there writing esoteric biomechanical blogs, trying to make myself feel more important. Oh, that's interesting. Do do you want to tell us why you think that is? Uh, You know, I think, I think some, I don't know how everyone feels about this stuff, but I, I didn't go on the internet because I had a grand desire to be seen and well-known. I, at the end of the day, part of why I like the internet is because I'm introverted. I like small groups of people and I was burnt out and I, and I like content creation. So I realized that I didn't have to burn out if I created content that was fun and creative for me. But I also don't really like feeling like the center of attention. I never have. And and the more that people follow me and take, because when you first start out, you feel like you're sort of like, um, you ever saw the movie Garden State where you're sta- they're standing over the canyon and it's raining and you're like screaming into a void. That's how starting out online feels like. You post <laughs> things online, you scream into a void, no one cares, no one pays attention to you. And you can sort of like enjoy this anonymity where you're terrified that everyone's going to hate you, but then like no one's listening and no one cares. And the difference is, is once you're like, quote unquote, known, and you have a little bit of notoriety, you post things and you start to realize that people are listening to you. And that's a lot of responsibility. And it's really scary. And so I think for me now, I worry a lot more about the impact of my words than I did when I was screaming into a void, because I'm not screaming into a void anymore. I post things and people respond very quickly. And so it really makes me wonder if I'm doing right by people, if I'm saying the right thing, if it's landing the way I want it to. I just think a lot more about impact now, I think. And I also a lot less dogmatic as a teacher. So it's harder for me to sort of get on a pedestal because my pedestal is like the shrug emoji a lot of the time. I go, I don't know. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> oh my gosh. I love this so much. It's it. I appreciate that you say that you did not start this to be like internet famous. And then that's kind of been a byproduct of you showing up and doing you. And also, I appreciate that the shrug emoji, like, I feel like the more I learn, the less answers I actually have. Someone will say to me, where in my body should I feel this? And I'm like, where are you feeling it? (laughs) That's my answer. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to tell you where you should feel it. I don't know. I can take a guess, but it could be very wrong. Yeah, I just, it, it, it's so nuanced now. All of the conversations are so nuanced. And I think the other thing is when I got on the internet four years ago, we weren't so culturally sensitive. And I'm not going to say whether it's better or worse that we're culturally sensitive, but we weren't so culturally sensitive. And now we're very culturally sensitive. And so it adds a whole nother layer of complexity to everything that you say, because if you have a conversation, conversation in real life and you're culturally sensitive, like you can read the people in front of you. You can tell if like you've hit a nerve, you can tell if you've done wrong, like you can get a reaction, like you can see it, you can read it. And when you post it online, sometimes you can't, you don't know who it's going to land in front of and you don't know how it's going to be interpreted. And so we're navigating a very different landscape on Instagram now and a very different conversation than we were four years ago, at least from what I've seen in this process. Yeah. Do you know, are there some things that you would have known along, or you know now that you wish you would have known at the beginning? Like, okay, I'm going to take my business online. These things would have been super handy to know much earlier. Uh, Well, so number one, starting an email list. Number two, liking being on video is not a prerequisite for being on video. It's also not a prerequisite for being good on video. Uh, people like to tell me that I'm good on video. I hate myself on video. I hate how I sound on video and everything I do in my business is video. It's fine. Uh, like I just get over it because for me, it's, I'm again, like I said, I'm not there to like look cute in a dumb outfit, even though that's like half of my brand, uh, ironically enough. It's right. I'm really just trying to find a way to get people to pay attention to information that they'd otherwise ignore. 
uh, and hopefully help find a way to make it fun so they'll use it and integrate it into their lives. So I think a lot of the time is we get so stuck on, I have to be good at this and I have to know what I'm doing. And the reality is, is that the only way you get good at it is by trying and when you first start, you'll, you're not going to be good at it because you're a beginner because no one's good when they're a beginner. So it's like when you start, you should just accept that you're going to get it wrong. You're going to do it wrong. It's all going to be terrible and bad. And that's absolutely okay. And it'll all get less terrible and less bad as time goes on. And, and when no one knows who you are, that's a perfect time to start posting things and be bad at it. No one cares and no one's paying attention. And you should revel in that and enjoy it because one day someone might pay attention and that's harder, I think. <laughs> I think it's so true. Oh my gosh. I love how you called to your brand. So I went to your YouTube today and I was like, oh, I love this. When did the fishnets come into this? Uh, so the fishnets happened, I want to say sometime late 2000, 2018. And, and what that came out of was I, I sort of grew up in like the very smart, heady biomechanical world. And right around that time was when people started getting really obsessive about biomechanics and at the same time started getting really obsessive about pain, about pain science. And I've always straddled the line where I think that, again, it depends and it matters and it's all useful, but all but none of it really matters except for how you apply it to the person in front of you. And so because I was the person who was writing things and posting things and I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut, I'd find myself in these flame wars where someone wanted to fight with me about it. Like they wanted to argue, it's this research paper. It's that biomechanics thing. Did you cite this? And I'm like, no, I didn't cite it. I'm an internet meme. Go away. Like I, I'm not here to fight with you. I'm just trying to give pe- help people have context for what they're struggling with. And so I just had this moment where I was like, all right, if I'm going to be online, like I, I'm just death to milk toast. Like I, I'm done. Like this isn't fun anymore. So it has to be fun or else I quit. And I was like, and if I, if I have to be another generic white blonde you know, B I T C H like in Lululemon, like reverently like frowning while doing toe taps, like with the right breathing, I was like, I'm going to stab myself in the head. And so I said, I think I'm going to do, <laughs> I said, I think I'm going to do, uh, basically a photo shoot with fishnets. And my friend who was helping me with marketing at the time was like, careful, you're going to look like a boudoir novel soon. I was like, I don't care. I'm so done. I'm so done with all of this. I do not care. Burn it to the ground. And so I, I did this photo shoot and then right around the time I did this photo shoot, like this is like, this is called dumb luck, how people start to notice you on the internet and you don't see it coming, right? Total dumb luck. I I'd entered to be in the next Pilates Anytime instructor competition, which is sort of a thing in Pilates land. And I went from being pretty unknown with some friends who were sort of known to suddenly everyone was paying attention to my Instagram. And I got the fishnet photos back right about the moment that that started, that I got in that competition. And so I essentially like posted the fishnet photos, like ducked and covered, like a bomb was going to come over my head and the sky <laughs> was going to fall. And then everyone was like, this is amazing. And I was like, crap, I've got a really good opportunity for my business. And so I just doubled down on the crazy for an entire month of posting with the fishnets and the outfits and the things. And then it became a thing. And now it's my brand is basically like biomechanics and fishnets. It's really weird. I don't understand it. (laughs) (laughs) I encourage our (laughs) listeners to go to your YouTube and check it out, like quickly scroll that or to your Instagram uh, because it's super fun. It definitely caught my attention for a moment. I was like, uh, looked at my topic list and then was like, um, is this the person I'm interviewing? Like what? And, And then I played a few of your videos and I love how you say that you still feel like you're not great on video because you are, and it's the price. <laughs> like you yeah. are, I watched some of them and I was like, well, this is really good. Like you've caught my attention with the visual that made me click and watch it. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, at this point, I would say my messaging is more around just having fun and not taking it so seriously while still having hopefully integrity of information. But I think that if people are trying to look at it from a branding perspective, I think that's the other thing is when I started out, like I remember writing the website copy for, it was really my second website. Uh, I was terrified. I was like, I have to get everything right. I have to get every word right. I was so in my head about it. 
And, and what I didn't realize then and what I realize now is that like, I'm going to change my mind all the time. It's going to evolve all the time. It's never going to stay the same. I'm never going to have the right answer because I'm always going to change my mind. And so I think that like, I, I sort of just kept falling forward. And I think if you scroll far enough back through my YouTube, because it started in 2014, or you scroll back far enough through my, uh, like through my Instagram, there was a day in my life when I still wore pants on the internet <laughs> and I no yes. longer do right so it's like your comfort zone will change and your brand will change and again you might not know where you're going to end up is what I'd say so I think this idea that everything's going to start branded and beautiful and polished that comes last like you you should start by putting stuff out there figuring out who your audience is and learning how to sell things and that you can figure out like the pretty branding stuff later. That doesn't need to come first. That can come way down the line. You don't, you don't need to have a real strong sense of who you are to get started. You kind of find that out by doing things, I think. Yeah, so true. So if one way to get in front of people online is video, because I think that's a really fast yes. way to build that no like, and trust. If you could only choose one platform for online video, what would it be? For getting people on a list, let's say, and for being able to do challenges, it's Instagram. Right now, it's Instagram. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, it was probably Instagram and Facebook, and a little bit before that, it was YouTube. Uh, but, but that being said, I think a, I think another way to talk about this, if you don't mind me sort of taking us on a small tangent, is thinking a, rather than thinking about. Um, the most effective place to use social media, I would think about it as the most effective way to repurpose your content in lots of places. So you can be everywhere at once with very, not very little work, but a lot less work. Uh, so for example, like my strategy, and this has been my strategy for a long time. And it's the one thing that I would say I've consistently used is that I will film, I'll batch film videos ahead of time for YouTube. Like let's say that they're really, they should be three to five minutes. You'll go on my page and I'll be like, some of these are 25 to 30. It's because I talk too much and I can't help myself. <laughs> but really, if I was going to give you, people can't read and they can't write and they can't pay attention. If you've seen The Bachelor, you know it's true. I fear for America. But <laughs> <laughs> right, people don't have a large attention span. So three to five minutes is great. But some of sometimes your audience doesn't mind longer. My audience actually loves longer. Uh, but, but basically I film, I, I sort of plan out content. I batch film a bunch of YouTube videos and then I clip those YouTube videos and I use them as individual Instagram posts. And then once a week I post that video to YouTube. And then I also then use that video is what I email my list about. So the same, and then if I was smart and I had more time, I would also update my blog more regularly. So that same video could become a blog post, a piece of YouTube content, the thing that I put on Instagram and the thing that I push to Facebook and the thing that I use to promote my list, because when I feel like it, I can always post in my Instagram post, Hey, if you want this full video, uh, I share the full, I'm going to share the full workout in two days with my list, hop on my list to get free workouts every week. So you basically, if you're smart about how you create content, you can create a small amount of content and get a really maximum bang for your buck. But if you're going to find a place to double down on that content right now in terms of people seeing it and possibly getting on your list and possibly getting exposure, I would use Instagram because Instagram is basically a giant search engine right now for yoga exercises. Right. And so here's a really uh, one thing that I want to highlight with the whole Instagram thing. There's a big difference between the yoga teacher who posts a really nice image and then the details of a workshop. Yes. the text. And I think the content that you're talking about, do you want to tell us about like, what content should we start with? If we're wanting to test it out, start crappy, build the audience. Yeah. So I think you need to start with who are you trying to attract? Uh, again, if, if you have a hard time with marketing and you've ever online dated, I'm sorry if this scars you, but you can think about it like the online dating profile, like like if you're trying to find your ideal mate, at this point, it's like your ideal client, right? It's, it's the same thing. So if like, let's say, you know, your student is someone who is, uh, they're kind of a workaholic. They, they love, they love, they love to sweat, but they know that they need a little bit of Zen in their life. They run and they, they strength train, but they also want more flexibility. And that's the person showing up in your class, right? Like you, like you want to think about their habits. 
And it might be that you're like a brilliant uh, movement teacher who also teaches somatics. And you know that even though every single one of your students who's a runner comes to you and they're like, but my tight hip flexors. And you think, oh, no, you need more stability. And flexibility is a dumb word. It's not flexibility. You don't need flexibility, right? And they're like, I'm so stressed out. And you're like, well, that's not really stress. You kind of lack interoception and like, right. Like, like you start, you immediately start translating their words into your words. You kind of have to work backwards. So what'll happen is, is we'll be like, well, they, they need to learn about their nervous system that this happens a lot. And so we'll be like, I, like I was just DMing with someone today who was trying to get people on her list who's general public. And she was like, today's newsletter is all about the nervous system. And, you know, no, no, um, no, no understanding of science required. And I looked at it and I was like, Hey, can I give you some drive by feedback? Cause I'm that person stalking your Instagram. Cause I know you asked me about copywriting yesterday. Uh, I, I was like, who is your student? Right. And it was a little bit of, in this case, like, she's like, Oh, well, they're a desk worker. And I was like, Oh, do they want flexibility? And she was like, yeah. And I go, do their, do their hips to feel stiff? She's like, yeah. And I go, you should talk about hip stiffness. And then, you know, you can teach them about the nervous system, but you should be like, hey, do your hips feel stiff? Um, My newsletter today is going to talk about ways to make your hips not feel stiff and you don't even have to stretch or be flexible. Or, you know, maybe she can talk about flexibility. I'm going to show you a way to have less hip stiffness and more flexibility. And she's going to teach a Romanian deadlift in that video. So (laughs) you kind of, right? Like she's not going to teach, she's not even teaching yoga in the video. So it's one of those things where when you're trying to think about what content to create, you want to think about what is the, what problem are you solving for your ideal client? So if your ideal client wants more flexibility, you should post videos that help people with flexibility. Even if you know that you're doing mobility, and even if you know that it's a strength exercise, you should probably create a video that's like, try this for more hamstring flexibility. And maybe it's, maybe the video is a deadlift, but because there's text on the video in the caption that says, do this for more hamstring flexibility, then you can explain why it's not a hamstring stretch in the caption, but you're speaking directly to that person because maybe they don't care about their hamstring strength. Maybe they don't care about strength training, but they want flexible hamstrings. So you got to kind of speak to the person in the language that they're going to use. So they understand that you're trying to reach and help them. So when you think about videos, like, yeah, pretty pictures might get you 500 likes, but it's not going to get you people who are going to give you money. You're better off making ugly little videos with some very clear text and the same filter every single time. So people start recognizing it as yours uh, with content that your people will find helpful, especially video, because that's really how people are engaging on Instagram right now, uh, more so than just having beautiful aspirational photos. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but mix them up. Have some videos, even if you don't like video. Right. So true. I mean, that takes the pressure off as well. They don't have to be perfectly edited videos or amazing photos. And we can really focus in on the message. Yeah. And they they won't be. I think that's the other thing, right? If you wait to try to make it perfect, it's never going to happen. Because what's going to happen is you're going to do it. And then in doing it, you're going to discover the things that make you crazy that you want to fix. And, you know, if you want to make your video look better, like get a microphone. I, I can send you a blog post on this if people want to access it. You know, buy some soft box lights off of Amazon that take, you know, they cost like 150 bucks. I'll just warn you right now. The instructions are terrible. It's like Ikea for lighting. Once you put it together <laughs> and you will cry, you will cry building these lights. Uh, see if you can help. If you can help it, never take them apart again because they're so hard to put together and then just stick them on like, like basically blow yourself out with giant lights and that'll make everything look better. But you know, if you don't want to go there yet, just take your iPhone, hit record and do something and see what happens. Right. This is such, such good advice for starting on video. (laughs) Is there anything else that you can think of that would help someone to move online? Is there any like last bit of advice that you would have? I mean, I, th- I think the thing is you got to think order of operations. So you have to start with who am I, who do I think I'm trying to target? And then once you think, who do you think, who do I think I'm trying to target? I'll just use my business as an example because I know it best. Uh, I knew because my in-person client were, were basically gym people who had pain. I knew that I was going to target gym people who had pain and I was going to teach them very, very, very boring post rehab exercises so they could do hard things and not hurt. I knew, I knew that was my audience. 
And so then I thought, great, well, I know where gym people who have pain are in real life because I met them in the gym. I taught classes in the gym that I was one of them. That's how I know. So then I went, well, where are these gym people who hurt going to be on the internet? Well, they're going to be following Beachbody. They're going to be following TRX. They're going to be following like hottie body, you know, macro fit girl who looks like she's going to rip your head off. Like, like these are where the gym people are going to be. So right. I went, great. I'm, I'm going to start, you know, being in those Facebook groups. And some of them were for me and some of them weren't and communicating there. And then when I ran ads, I wasn't going to run ads to other people who liked, to people who liked Pilates pages. I was going to run ads to people who loved crazy aggressive gym workouts, but were a little bit older. Because when you're 20, you're not going to hurt. But when you're 40 and you do that stuff, you are. Right. And so that's how I started getting those people on my list. That's how those people started following me. And then from there, I started running surveys and doing test ads and seeing like what people kept asking for help with or saying that was an issue for them. And essentially, the thing that came up through a variety of tests and sur- you know, basically sending surveys to my list uh, was that everyone had hip stiffness. So I thought I was going to sell an online program for shoulders. And I went, nope, no one cares about shoulders. Everyone cares about hips. So I did a free challenge for hip stiffness. Well, no, that's not true. I did a free guide for hip stiffness, which was three exercises. And then I did a five-day challenge for hip stiffness. And then notice the theme. And then I went into a launch sequence about an at-home program that you could do for hip stiffness so you could do your hard gym things and not hurt. And so that was, right? And and notice, I wasn't like, do you have lumbopelvic stability? I was like, (laughs) right? I was like, got tight hip flexors? feel like your hips are stiff, don't want stiff hips, here's some stuff you can do. Like, and, and it, 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 they're dumb words, but they were the right words for my people because my people don't even know what stability is yet. I can't lead in with stability. I can educate them in a sales email about why, you know, they can squat a hundred pounds, but their hips still hurt because they're not stable and they don't know how to track and control their range of motion. I can, I can educate them in a sales email and then tell them why I'm going to have them do terribly boring exercises and I'm so sorry for it and they should buy my thing anyways. But I can't, I, I can't start there. I can't lead in there with my marketing. I have to have a relationship first and then once they're on my list, I can do that. But that's a lot of action steps. That was like two years of action steps before I was like, hey, I have a thing, you can buy it. And then right. it was much easier, right? After that, after I'd done it with one program, the second program was much easier. But it it really took stumbling around online and figuring out what resonated with people and testing the idea. I didn't create the product first. I really create the relationships in the network first. And then I created the product second. And all of my money in those two and a half years were made from training people in person and teaching workshops and teaching live classes. Um, I really didn't start making money online until two years after I decided I was going to start making money online. This is amazing. Relationships first, and then the profit follows. That's huge. Uh, And also that you took your experience teaching in person. If our yoga teacher listeners want to reach out to you or follow you or see the work that you're doing, where's the best place to go? Uh, I mean, the hub of my stuff would be my website, which is my last name, which is a terrible idea because it's impossible to spell, but it's nablevy.com. And then if you want to connect with me on Instagram, which is the easiest way to connect with me in real time, I have two accounts. I have my quote unquote big account, which is my fitness account. And it's just at Nab Levy, which is my last name, but no hyphen, the same way that my uh, website has no hyphen. And then uh, my marketing account is called PS by my shit. So that's the handle for it. <laughs> Connected yoga teachers, I'm popping in here for a quick minute to let you know why it is that we bleep out swear words. Uh, Some of you may not know that sometimes I can be known for swearing a little bit too much in my own personal life. And I always have the saying that I have corrupted my own children, who, by the way, probably don't swear as much as I do, and tell me not to be swearing as much as I do. And I kind of had the saying, like, I don't want to be corrupting other people's children who might be riding around in the car with them. So in case you're ever wondering of why it is that we censor out the swear words here, that's part of it. And we decided to do it a long time ago with the podcast. We continue to do it. And uh, in no way am I saying you can't be out there, you know, cursing your head off in your own personal life. (laughs) It just gets bleeped out on the podcast. 
If you're wanting to hear a really good bleep episode, episode 100 is one of our favorites for such colorful language. If you want marketing advice uh, on how to, you know, get people to come to your live or online things in yoga land, uh, follow PS by my shit. If you want to see how I take those ideas and I use them to sell fitness and movement things to general public and teachers, then you can follow my at NabLevy account. So I'd say one of them, the NabLevy accounts are a really good one to watch for seeing how I actually sell movement. Uh, but if you want actual marketing tips, you're not going to find much over there. You should follow the PS by my account for that. Okay, perfect. We will make sure to link to both of those <laughs> in our show notes for sure, along with your website also. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of your time today. This is a lot of great information. Of course. Thanks for chatting with me. This stuff is so fun. Connected yoga teachers, I want to hear from you. What were your key takeaways today? Thank you again, Nikki, for all of your wisdom and knowledge and your fun spirit in sharing that. Some of my key takeaways, some of the things that I jotted down during this interview were one, start an email list. This is so huge. If you have not already started to collect your email addresses of your students, how can you begin to do that? We have some great episodes and we'll link to those in the show notes all about how to build your email list. My number two takeaway is get comfortable with video and be okay with being imperfect. Alicia Baruti was here in a previous episode and she really got into this topic of getting confident with doing video. Takeaway number three is your website and your brand will evolve over time. I feel like this takes some of the pressure off. We don't have to have everything perfect. We're putting it out there. We're being okay with that B minus work. Takeaway number four is batch and reuse your content. When I was hearing Nikki's process with this, I was thinking, okay, this is something that I could definitely look at in my own business to reuse that content. I love making new content and there are times when I'm not using the content from the podcast, let's say, on all of my social media channels. Takeaway number five was how to give students what they're asking for, even when you know they need something different. So this might be the student who comes in and is super fidgety and they want to move and bounce around (laughs) and do more and do more. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, if this person could learn how to settle into relaxation, what a difference it would make in their world. Takeaway number six is get to know your audience and their needs. I am so curious how you're doing this. We had a great conversation with Steph Crowder. It was live in our Facebook group, and that will be coming out as a podcast episode down the road. But if you're looking for that, I can definitely link to it in our show notes. So Steph came in and did a training and it's a lot of the time how to get to know our yoga students. And one key piece of that was to be in conversation with them. If you are wanting to connect and work together, connected yoga teachers, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. One, there might be spaces still available in the yoga for pelvic health training. If not, get on the wait list for that. Reach out to me and tell me that you're interested for the next one. And another way that you can work with me is through a one-on-one consultation call. To find out about any of these things, any of our offerings, go to theconnectedyogateacher.com and search around on our website. There are also some great freebies on our website, some challenges that you can join. And I'm working on something, putting it out there soon to really help us to get all set up for this fall, specifically around getting online. So keep your eyes out for that. Make sure that you're on my email list. I want to say a huge thank you to you, dear listener, for coming and hanging out today, spending time together. I know that you have a lot of things on your plate, so it means so much when you spend the time here listening to the podcast, taking in this information. I would love to hear how you're using this in your yoga business. If there's one thing that you could take away today and start doing, tag me on social media or send me a note or leave me a voicemail. You can see how to do that on the connectedyogateacher.com. 
Also, huge thank you to our team over here, Suzanne, Crunch, Nick, and Sinead for making today's podcast episode possible, and also for supporting our Facebook group full of amazing yoga teachers. Alrighty, Connected Yoga Teachers, before I sign off, I would love to know what will you be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, to your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up. <laughs>